As a professional wrestler, there are a lot of good times to quit your job, and all of them are significantly better than right before a big show. I'm Andy for What Culture Wrestling, and here are 10 times wrestlers quit before major pay-per-views. Number 10, Steve Austin, WWE King of the Ring 2002. In what was supposed to be a dream match for the ages, Stone Cold was going to wrestle Eddie Guerrero on this show. Until less than two weeks away from the event itself, Austin walked out on WWE, having learned that he'd been booked to lose to Brock Lesnar in a Raw main event. Obviously, this meant that the Eddie match was cancelled, and Guerrero ended up wrestling Ric Flair instead. Not a bad substitute, all things considered, but Austin sat out for the best part of a year after this, not returning until he'd paid Vince McMahon a hefty fine worth around a quarter million dollars. An expensive walkout, but a walkout nonetheless. Number 9, Ultimate Warrior WWF Survivor Series 1992. An old Survivor Series 92 poster features the Ultimate Warrior and Randy Savage going up against Ric Flair and Razor Ramon. The problem with that is that Warrior never ended up on the show. Unhappy with his direction and with allegations of steroid abuse, flying around the wrestling business like midges in a Scottish summer, Warrior bounced, forcing the company to rapidly replace him with Mr. Perfect in the tag match, with Kurt Hennig making a quick and convoluted face turn to facilitate this. Warrior's 1992 return was supposed to peak with him getting another run with the world title. Instead, he ended up getting suspended for what Vince McMahon called experimental growth hormone treatment, leading to him no-showing a bunch of dates and eventually just straight up leaving. Number 8, Jeff Jarrett, WWF No Mercy, 99. Jeff Jarrett decided to up sticks and leave for WCW in 1999. This was a common occurrence during the Monday Night Wars, but there was just one problem in this case. Double J was still the Intercontinental Champion. Jarrett did end up wrestling China for the belt at No Mercy 99, doing so in a good housekeeping match transparently designed to make him look as dumb as possible on his way out the door. But, according to wrestling lore, this came at a cost for one Vince McMahon. The popular story going around is that Jarrett actually extorted Vince for around $200,000 in order to convince him to drop the belt, preventing him from going to WCW with it still around his waist. Now, Jarrett has disputed this, claiming that he was only ever paid what WWE owed him, but that's no fun, is it? Number 7, Steve Austin, WWE Taboo Tuesday 2005. The build to this pay-per-view saw Jim Ross fired as WWE's lead announcer and replaced by Jonathan Coachman. Austin, a good friend of JR's, was supposed to have a match stipulating that if he won, Ross would be brought back. And WWE went all in on promoting this, doing so on television and online, which was surprising given that Stone Cold had actually retired after his wrestling Mania 19 match with The Rock, but all was not well behind closed doors. Austin learns that he was actually booked to lose, causing him to walk away from the pay-per-view and WWE. Batista ended up replacing him, and no, Big Dave did not lose to Jonathan Coachman, squashing him in a few short minutes. Number 6, Randy Savage, TNA Final Resolution 2004. One of the weirder surprises in TNA history went down at Victory Road 2004, when a black-clad Randy Savage appeared and confronted NWA world champion Jeff Jarrett. The Macho Man then led an attack on Jarrett, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash on television, leading to what was supposed to be his last ever wrestling match, teaming with AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy to face the Kings of Wrestling in a six-man tag. Well, that match actually happened and Savage got the pin, unfortunately entering a performance to forget in the process. And from there, the Macho Man was supposed to go on and face Jeff Jarrett for the world title at the upcoming Final Resolution show. Unfortunately, however, the two parties could not agree on the finish, and Savage, believe it or not, actually wanted to go over. He ended up quitting, and Monty Brown
Brown got the spot instead. Number 5. Mike Awesome ECW Hardcore Heaven 2000 Mike Awesome quitting ECW as the company's World Heavyweight Champion in 2000 caused quite the headache for Paul Heyman. Though he was at least spared the embarrassment of Awesome potentially wearing the belt on WCW Nitro, which WCW scrapped when they realised it would be a real legal pain in the ass. Leaving ECW just before Hardcore Heaven, where he was supposed to drop the belt to Tommy Dreamer, Awesome ended up wrestling a WWE wrestler, Taz, instead. WCW and ECW had struck a deal to allow Awesome, who was signed to WCW by then, to appear at the pay-per-view. And separately, WWE and ECW struck their own deal, with Taz coming in and taking the belt and good old Tommy Dreamer providing the assist. Number 4. CM Punk WWE WrestleMania 30 Leaving WWE for a multitude of reasons after the 2014 Royal Rumble, one of which being that he wasn't going to headline WrestleMania again, CM Punk walked out on the company in a storm of controversy, and is yet to truly return more than seven years later. Punk was done. But it wasn't until July of that year that WWE moved him to the alumni section on their website, never truly issuing a statement on his official departure. Punk later revealed that WWE had actually released him on the day of his wedding that June, with nobody from the company even contacting him after a two month suspension for walking out. Petty, petty, petty. Number 3. Ric Flair WCW Great American Bash 1991 Booked to defend his WCW World Championship against Lex Luger at the Great American Bash 91 with the match billed as Legend vs Legacy, Ric Flair ended up quitting the company due to a bunch of clashes with executive Jim Hurd. Hurd, who Flair accused of knowing nothing about professional wrestling, saw Ric as being past his prime. He wanted him to not only take a pay cut, but shave his head, wear diamond earrings, and go by the name Spartacus. And why? In one of the most famous ship jumping incidents in wrestling history, Flair left WCW and arrived in WWE as the real world champion, bringing the big gold belt with him. Refusing to return the strap after WCW allegedly failed to return the $25,000 owed to him upon his dismissal, Flair's quest to be recognised as the top guy in all of pro wrestling culminated in the best Royal Rumble match ever. That's a fact, not an opinion, as he threw Hulk Hogan over the top rope to become the real, real world champion in 1992. Number 2. Ultimate Warrior Again WWF In Your House 9 International Incident That reasonable, well-adjusted and not at all bigoted man, Ultimate Warrior, quit WWE entirely before In Your House 9 International Incident in 96, where he was supposed to team with Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson to face Camp Cornette. What's happened here is, well, a total mess. Warrior missed a bunch of house shows, he no-showed the dates. He claimed that this was down to him grieving the death of his father, but Vince McMahon countered this. He questioned Warrior's relationship with his father, who Vince reckoned Warrior hadn't actually seen in a decade. The chairman didn't accept Warrior's explanation, so off he went, straight into the bin. Warrior later claimed that the real reason he no-showed was due to a merch-related breach of contract. Either way, Psycho Sid replaced him at In Your House. Number 1. Goldberg and Brock Lesnar WWE WrestleMania 20 Goldberg vs Lesnar at WrestleMania 20 is a legendary match for all the wrong reasons, as both men were booed out of the building following news that both were on their way out of the company, leaving special guest referee Steve Austin as the only participant capable of drawing a non-toxic reaction. The match is, frankly, an all-time shambles, and after it, Goldberg effectively slipped into retirement. Lesnar, meanwhile, only handed in his notice one week before Mania. He he fell into an almighty legal soup, with WWE trying to hold him to a ridiculous non-compete clause preventing him from working for other promotions until 2010. WWE claimed that Lesnar had breached this by appearing for New Japan in 2004, but after a long court battle, common sense prevailed. The two parties reached a settlement and the case 
was dismissed. Regardless, it would be eight full years before WWE saw Lesnar again. So that's our list, but what do you guys think? Can you think of any others? Let us know in the comments section below. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. Then you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE, and you can follow myself at AndyHMurray, but you can tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.